All right, now there's a particular phrase that I want to point out here in Ephesians 4. It comes in verse 13. It says, till we all come in the unity of faith. And that's going to be the title of my sermon this morning, is the unity of faith. There's a lot of misunderstandings about, you know, having unity and being united in the faith that, that's going on today. And I want to teach, because you, having unity of the faith is extremely important. And I want this church to be unified in what we believe. You think about that word unity. That word unity literally just means, you, think, you know, like, unit, like a unicycle is a bike with one wheel, right? That uni means one. So unity in the church is going to be making this church one. We should all have the same focus, the same direction, the same understanding, the same beliefs, right? I mean, obviously there might be some little differences, you know, individually, but we're not, you know, we're talking about just, just major beliefs and, and just being unified together um, as a church. Now, if our church is unified, we're going we're gonna to essentially have the same doctrines. We're going to believe the same thing from the Bible. We're not going to be believing differently about things like baptism. You know, some people think that, like, well, you need to be baptized in order to be saved. Well, in order to be unified in this church, we can't have some people thinking that you know, salvation comes through baptism and some people not. That's gonna, you know, that is not a unified church. Um, we're definitely not going to be believing different about salvation in any regards, whether it be works. And that's just one example. You know, there's a lot of things that, that the whole goal is to have our church unified and unified behind God's word. Okay, not just unified behind, you know, the commandments of man. Not just because I might say a certain thing. No, what we need to be unified behind is the scripture and what God's word says. And we need to decide what is the truth and what do we believe from the Bible. Amen. Now, the Bible says, you don't have to turn there, in Psalm 133.1, uh, the Bible says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The Bible is saying it's great for brethren, for, for those that are saved, your brothers and sisters in Christ, to dwell together in unity. We all ought to have the same focus, the same goals. But see, a lot of people will criticize, especially the fundamental Baptist movement, and they'll say that, well, you're so divisive, and you know, you, you preach so much on all these doctrines and the law and all these other things, and you know, a lot of people will try to tell you, well, there shouldn't be so much fighting over doctrine. You just need to be more tolerant and just accepting of everything. And I'll tell you, that is not biblical. That is not scriptural. I'm going to prove that to you from the Bible. We're going to see that from God's Word. And you can decide for yourself if what, I, if, if what I'm saying here is right and what's true. First of all, let's go back to Ephesians 4. We're going to, go, we're going to look at verse number 2. It says, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So, the way that we're going to have unity, first of all, within the church, is saying you need to have a lowly, meek, and long-suffering spirit with, with people in general. You know, we can't have a proud attitude. You know, you can't have people talking about, you know, especially when we're talking about doctrine, we're talking about all these things that matter. You can't just be lifted up with pride if we're going to be in unity with others. You know, we need to, to, to approach one another with humility. You know, if you believe something different about the Bible, hey, that's fine. But when you go to, uh, you know, talk to someone about it, if you say, hey, Pastor Burzens, I don't believe that what, you know, what you believe about such and so a doctrine or, or this thing. The, the wrong way to approach that is to just come up and be like, you know what, you're just wrong and just, and just come out with a proud, you know, haughty attitude. What you need to do, especially with a, with a pastor, is, you know, um, you treat them as an elder, as, as you would your own father. You can treat them with respect. But that goes even without just, just talking to the pastor, even your other members in the church. You know, you ought to be humble. You ought not to be lifted up with pride. And in order to keep that unity, because what happens when you have pride and you go to someone, that's just going to turn them away and it's going to get them defensive. It's going to cause more strife than anything. There's, there are very good ways to, to discuss your, your differences and especially going to the Bible, but doing it meekly, doing it humbly. And have long suffering with people. It says, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Um, the Bible says in verse 4 then, it says, there is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. These things are all important. He says, look, there's one Lord. There is one faith. 
There is one baptism. These things are all important. We need to understand what all of those are. We understand the one God, the one baptism, that one faith, and we need to be united in our beliefs about these things. And that's why he keeps on saying there's one, there's one, there's one, because we have that unity, the unity of the, of the one belief together. Jump down to verse number 11. It says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? Why do we have a pastor? Why do we have an evangelist? Why do we have all these things that God has given to us? It says in verse 12, For the perfecting of the saints. And if you're saved this morning, you are a saint. You're sanctified. That's what the word Amen. saint means. You are a saint because you have been purged of your sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of the Christ. And, and the body of Christ this morning is this church. We are part of the body of Christ. And God has given the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to perfect that, to, to, to bring us all together into unity and to, for the teaching and, and edifying of the body of Christ. It says in verse 13, till we all come in the unity of, of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a complete man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then in verse 14, it follows it up. And see, I want to make a point of this because so many people think, oh, you shouldn't be so concerned about doctrine, right? Doctrine just divides people and we just need to focus only on Jesus Christ and that's it. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches here. Look at verse 14, because it just follow, it's following up with saying, why do we have apostles? Why do we have pastors? Why do we have teachers? It's for the perfecting of the saints. It's so we can all come to unity of faith. Verse 14, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are people out there that are out to deceive you with the Bible. Yeah. There are people out there that want to teach you falsehoods from the Bible. And believe it or not, I know it's, it's, it's hard for most people to grasp this because most people aren't just extremely wicked with a desire to deceive and with a desire to go after and hurt people. But there are people out there that are like that. And there are people out there that, because it's not maybe you wouldn't be thinking like, why would I care about, you know, teaching, just knowingly teach some false doctrine to people out there. But, but it's true. The Bible goes over these false prophets, and we're going to get into that a little bit. They are out there to deceive. And that's why it says, look, you don't want to be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You need to know the Bible. That's why God has given us pastors and teachers, and he's filled you with the Holy Spirit. You have God's word so that people can't come and deceive you because there is the slight of men, cunning craftiness. People craft doctrine in ways to get you to accept them and get you to believe it. You need to be, to be solidly just, just steadfast on God's word and get planted in, in a good church and get planted in more even just getting a church is reading this book yep. every day of your life. Amen. Get that teaching from the Holy Spirit so that nobody else can come to you and deceive you. That if you're reading God's word and someone else comes to you and says, hey, the Bible says you need to be doing this. Well, if you're reading that, you'll know whether or not the Bible really says that. You should be able to know that for yourself. And, and this is something more important than, I mean, hey, going to church is, is important. I believe that from the bottom of my heart. I believe it's a sin not to come to church. But even more important than that is your own personal Bible reading and your own walk with God in this sense of knowing the Bible for yourself. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people will think that, um, you know, we shouldn't be fighting so much over doctrine. Or um, they'll say things like, I I've heard this before, well, how do you know that you're right and, you know, and this other guy's wrong? And they say because, like, they'll say, how do you know that? So we basically shouldn't even talk about it at all because who knows who's right? And, you know, typically this is coming from someone who doesn't know the Bible because they don't know for themselves. They're saying, well, how could you possibly know? Well, how you could possibly know is by reading the Scripture and studying it and meditating on it and looking through the Bible and knowing that, for one, God's word does not contradict itself. God is not the author of confusion. God's not going to tell you one thing here and then something completely different over here and make up all different sets of rules and, and they don't match up with each other. Amen. We know that God's word has to be consistent with itself. So for one, one way you can know if something is right is if you find a contradiction somewhere else in the Bible of what you're saying, then what you're saying is probably wrong. Or it is wrong. Because God's word isn't going to contradict itself. Um, 
and you know a lot of people have this attitude well we just all need to get along and like bring all the different denominations and everybody together all just under Jesus because you know we all just love Jesus now we're called to be in unity as we saw with our doctrine it's not something that we need to be ignored and that's what Ephesians 4:14 is warning about now turn if you would to Jeremiah chapter 23 because we're gonna see some of God's preaching against people who might call themselves pastors or prophets that are false teachers. We're going to see that in Jeremiah chapter 23 in the Old Testament. And this is what I was talking about a little earlier about people who lie and wait to deceive. People who literally want to teach you falsehoods and false doctrine. These are people you have to look out for. And this is one of the reasons why you don't want to just, just yoke up and group up with everybody that calls themselves a Christian. This is why we stand firm on particular doctrines because there are people out there that are just looking to deceive and it's just they're, they're looking to cause confusion and they're of the devil. Look at verse number 14 of Jeremiah chapter 23. And we're going to turn to a lot of scripture this morning because I firmly believe that everything that I preach ought to be coming directly from the Bible and I want you to see this for yourself. So just Amen. you know, bear with me. If we have to wait a minute for people to catch up, that's fine. But we're going to be, I want you to look at this Bible scripture with me so that you can see it for yourself in plain black and white. Jeremiah 23, look at verse number 14. It says, I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. He says in verse 14, look, I have seen also in the prophets. This is something he's seeing in the preachers, the prophets, the people who are supposed to be men of God, the people who are, you know, running churches or whatever, people who are, are supposed to be these men of God committing adultery, walking in lies, strengthening the evildoers, the people who are doing wickedness, they're strengthening their hands. They're encouraging them. They're helping them to do their evil work. It says, None doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants are of as Gomorrah. Let's keep reading. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, The Lord hath said, Ye shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. So this is one of the message, messages that these false prophets are preaching. They're saying, Oh, peace. Everything's okay, right? They're saying that, um, they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil is going to come on you. Do whatever it is that you think is right in your heart. Hey, and these, are, these churches are alive and well today. These are the churches that are going to tell you everything's fine, sin's not that bad, just keep doing what you're doing. You know, God doesn't care. Hey, we're all under grace, brother. Everything's fine. Just live the way you want and everything's just fine. Everything's going to go great for you. You know, you're going to be in prosperity. You're going to be, you know, getting all these riches and stuff. Watch out for those false prophets because they'll say they get a word from God, but it's not from God. According to the Bible here, he's saying, um, the prophets that prophesy unto you, they make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord in verse 16. He's saying it didn't come from God's mouth. God didn't say this. It's coming from your own, their own hearts. They're just prophesying unto you and saying, hey, this is what God said. And it's not really what God said. They're saying these things. And, and you got to watch out for yourself. In this church, we do a lot of preaching against sin. But again, as we saw in Ephesians 4, it's for the perfecting of the saints. It's not to make you just... just just feel bad about yourself and, and God some big meaning. No, it's not what it is at all. It's, it's to help you to grow. I mean, wouldn't you... It, who here would say that they love God? Just honestly, we say you love God, right? Everybody. I mean, who, who's going to say they don't love God, right? <laughs> and, and be sitting in a church this morning. No. We love God. If you love God, you're going to want to please Him and make Him happy, right? I mean, that, that just makes sense. I love my children. I like to make them happy, right? There's things... Just you love one another. You, you try to do things to please them. 
Well, if we love God, we're going we're to want to please him. One of the ways we're going to do that, one of the best ways to do that is by obeying his laws. And just if he tells us to do something, instead of being disobedient, let's just listen and do that. This is why we preach a lot on sin and we preach on these things. Because, hey, if you're doing something and if you love God, you should want to stop doing something that God said not to do. It only makes sense. Right? But unfortunately, a lot of people, they love their sin so much that they can't handle it and say, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. And, you know, that's between you and God if that's the way that you want to live. But a lot of people don't want to hear that. They don't even want to hear you. No one likes to be heard that they're told that they're being something wrong. They're doing something wrong. They, no one likes to hear that. I mean, it's something to hear. You're just like... I'm not that bad, you know, because like, I'm, I'm pretty good. That's not wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. But, um, but this is why we do that. We need, and, and we need to watch out because there's a lot of churches out there today. There's a lot of people that just say, hey, everything's fine. Hey, we need to just, just throw our arms, around, arms around everybody and all just come together under Jesus Christ. Well, I don't want to do that with some false teacher. Yeah, man. I don't want to do that with someone who's just saying, this is what God said and God didn't really say that. That's right. Yep. I don't want to have any fellowship with that person. Amen. Jump down to verse 21. We're in, we're in Jeremiah 23. Just skip down to verse 21. This is God saying, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. Now, do you want to sit and hear some, just some guy coming up and just preaching, hey, this is what God said, and it's not really what God said? Because I don't, I, don't I don't want to hear somebody telling me lies and deceiving me, saying, hey, this is from the mouth of God. Hey, I had a dream last night, and this is what God wants you to know. Right. No, we have God's word here today, and this is why we're turning all the scripture. Yeah. Because I'm going to say, hey, look, this is what God said because it's written in the Holy Bible. Yeah. And this is what we're reading this morning. Verse number 22. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words... Look at this. Then they should have turned from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Again, this is God saying this is what they should have done. Hey, if they're preaching the right thing, then they should be turning from their evil way. They should be getting this sin out of their life and not doing these things. If you're going to be preaching God's word, then this is the result that should be happening. It's in God's counsel to cause people to hear God's words. Then they should, not have they should have turned from their evil way and from their evil of their doings. Verse 23, it says, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophets said. They prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long... Shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceits of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. God is against those people. God is against the false prophets that are preaching lies in his name, saying, hey, God has said this when God didn't say that. Verse 31, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy falsely. How many times does he have to say it? God is against these people. Right? I mean, he said it over and over again. I am against those prophets. I am against them. I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies. And look at this, and by their lightness. People just making light of God's word, making light of what God has told us. And, and we say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, don't worry about it. It's, everything's fine. And that's causing the people to err, to error, to make mistakes, to, to not be right with God. It's leading people astray from God when, when these prophets are prophesying these lies and using lightness in their preaching. He says, yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. And it's, it's always important. See, people have this, this tendency to think that all churches are good. Because on the appearance, you say, okay, well, you know, they're worshiping God. Hey, these are good people. Now, you might know some of the people in, in, you know, that attend a church. I'm not saying that they're all evil people. 
But some of these churches, they'll have an evil, an evil leader, an evil pastor behind it that's teaching the lies unto these people. A lot of people just get deceived. It doesn't make every single one of those people you know, inherently evil. No, we ought to love those people and, you know, and just try to teach them the truth and show them what the Bible says. But there are evil prophets, false teachers that are doing these things. And this is of the devil. Now, th just think about a con man, right? Someone who's trying to deceive you. Think about people who get, you know, do earn a living by just deceiving people and, and you know, getting them to, to give them money, right? The way they do that is first they have to build confidence in that person. Right? No one's just going to be like, oh, oh, you, you want $1,000? Here, here's $1,000. Know? You have to build some kind of confidence. They have to have some kind of story. And usually the best con men are going to be the ones that are going to look the most sincere, the most true, the ones that have the best stories, the ones that, that are able to, to build that confidence with you. Well, it's the same way with Satan. Okay? Satan, it says you know, that he's, a, he's transformed as a minister of light. And, his, and, his, and his, the devils basically are the same way that they come to you looking good. And the, the false prophet, it says he's, um, you know, he, he's a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, on the outside, they look great, right? They talk the talk. They can say all the right words. Hey, praise God, brother. Hey, you know, and, and, just, and just use kind of a religious speak to where you could think, oh, okay, this guy's pretty good. But on the inside, they're a wolf and they're looking to devour you. This is what we need to be on the lookout for, and this is who we do not want to be unified with at all. We need to be able to spot this and spot the false prophets. And the way that you're going to understand whether or not a person is a false prophet is what comes out of their mouth. What are they teaching? What are they preaching? Does it line up with God's word? And again, the only way you're going to know that is if you know the Bible for yourself. You have to know this book for yourself. Otherwise, you're going to be a lot more susceptible to people just teaching lies unto you without you knowing. If someone says, hey, God said this and you haven't even read the Bible, how are you going to know if God said that? We need to know this book. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 10. Because another thing that people will say, well, no, we need to be unified around Jesus, right? It's all, it's all just about Jesus. You know, none of this other stuff is that important. Let's just get everybody unified together around Jesus. Well... You may or may not know this, but Jesus Christ didn't come to unify the entire world together and just bring everybody together and just be completely tolerant, just, just bring everyone in together no matter what. Jesus Christ came to divide. And that's what it says in the Bible. You're in Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew 10, look at verse number 34. Matthew 10, verse 34. These are the words of Jesus Christ. He says... Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Jesus Christ, and he's going right down to the family. He's saying, I'm dividing right down. I'm going to be separating mother-in-law from the daughter-in-law. I'm going to be separating, you know, son against father. I'm going to be, this is, this is divisive. Jesus Christ is bringing a sword. The word of God is a two-edged sword. In um, Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word pierces through right to your heart. It goes right in your body. And because God's word pierces so deep, hey, that is going to be able to, that's going to cause some people that don't believe in God's word to, to be at, at variance with you, to be at strife with you, to be to, to not be in unity with you because if you got one person that believes God's word is true and, and your faith is in God's word, another person who, is, who doesn't believe that at all, they think it's a fairy tale or something else, hey, yeah. you're not going to be unified at all. God's word is dividing right there saying this person believes, this person doesn't. Yeah. Um, that's why we have people going to heaven and some people going to hell. Okay, there's a division there. Not everybody is just all going to go to heaven when we die. Only those that have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's believing on God's word, which is what has divided us. Divided 
all the people of this earth into two categories, heaven and hell. Amen. And it's all just based on faith, but it's, that's a division that happens. Um, turn, if you would, to John chapter 7. I'm going to read from you from Exodus chapter 8. Even in back in Exodus. See, God's consistent all the way through the Bible. This isn't just a New Testament teaching, and it's not just an Old Testament teaching. It's all throughout the Bible. Exodus 8.22 says, And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. This is when Moses was, was um, bringing forth all the plagues of God on, on, the, on the people of Egypt. It says, To the end that thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. So he's bringing these plagues so that you know, the whole world's going to know there is a true God and it's the Lord. And um, it says in verse 23, And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. God was dividing the people and saying, Look, there's a difference. These are my people. You are of the world. You are a heathen. You are unsaved. And these are my people. God made that division. And um, in Luke 12, 51 says, Jesus Christ again said, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. You're in John chapter 7. Look down at verse number 40 of John 7. The Bible says, Many of the people therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. The division came. People were divided because of Jesus Christ, because of the words that he was saying, because of the doctrine that he was teaching, because he claimed to be the Christ, the Son of God. And there was a division because of that. Jesus didn't come just to bring everyone. Now, now does Jesus want everybody unified together in the, in the faith? Absolutely. The Bible says that God's not willing to any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. God wants all of us to be saved and to be in unity, but he's not going to do it just by any means necessary. God's not going to say, well, in order to bring everyone together, we're just going to lower our standards and we're just going just gonna to say everything goes and just tolerate everything. Right. That's not the way he does it. He says, no, I want everyone believing my way. I want everyone believing my words. That's what he, He's not going to say, okay, well, just to kind of bring you in and get more people here unified, we're just going to forget that I said all these other things. That's not the way God works. He, just, he wants us all to, to have our faith in him and to believe him. Um, there's this ecumenical movement which is completely of Satan that's going on, that's trying to bring all of, the, the, all of Christianity and even beyond Christianity. I mean, depending on how far some of these people go, they're just saying, hey, look, we all worship the same God. Yes. Amen. Right. They'll say it doesn't matter. You know, we have these Muslims and we've got these Hindus and we've got you know, all of Christianity. Hey, you know, they're just following what they have to follow, but it's all the same God. As long as they have faith in what they have, then they're all good. And I'll tell you what, that is a lie out of hell. That is a lie from Satan to just trick people into thinking that they're okay, that they're saved. Hey, Christianity, the Bible is divisive. Yeah, amen. The Bible says, you know, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's under the name of Jesus Christ. It is not Muhammad. It is not Allah. It is not Buddha. It is not any of these other things. They cannot save you. They are false gods. You can only be saved through Jesus Christ. We do not worship all the same God. Jesus Christ said to the Pharisees, You are of your, your father the devil. And who among all the people could have been closer to saying they worship the same God? Even they didn't worship the Lord. They didn't believe in the God of the Bible, even though they claim to believe in Moses' law. Jesus said, if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he spoke of me. He wrote of me. That's what Jesus Christ said himself. They didn't worship God the Father. They did not believe on him, even though they claimed to. There's a lot of people today that claim to believe in Jesus. They claim to believe in God, but they really don't in their hearts because they don't believe God's words. Amen. Turn, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And see, one of the problems with this, with this ecumenicalism of just bringing everyone together, see, Satan has a plan to do that. Satan has a plan to have a one world religion. Satan wants all the religions of the world to come together, but it's going to be to worship him, not to worship God. We're going to see some prophecies, we're going to see some, some scripture regarding Satan's plan to build a one world government, a one world religion. 
In 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, we need to be aware of this. We need to be aware of the devil's plan to do this stuff so that you don't get deceived or caught up into this, this thought or belief that we have to just bring everybody together. We need to bring everybody together, but around God's word, just around belief in his word, not, not just compromising. Look at uh, verse number 1 of Thess 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, so this is talking about Jesus Christ's second coming. It's talking about the rapture. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. He's saying, don't let anyone deceive you. Don't let anyone trick you into thinking that, hey, the day of Christ is at hand. It's going to happen at any moment. It can happen before this service ends. He's saying, don't fall for that. Amen. Verse number three, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Jesus Christ is not going to come back until the son of man, until the man of perdition is revealed, until we know, like, hey, this is who it is, when it says in verse four, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. When a man comes and he sits in the temple of God and he says, I am God in the flesh, basically you'll be saying something like, I am the second coming of Jesus Christ. When he's sitting in the temple and he's saying that, okay, then we know that the yeah. times are at hand when Jesus Christ is going to come back. Then we know it's going to happen. But he says, don't be deceived. That's not going to happen first. But what I want to point out even more important than that, because it's, this sermon isn't about the rapture, it's, but it's about Satan's plan to bring about a one world religion. And it's going to be focused on him. So when he sits in that temple and he proclaims himself to be God, this is his plan. Jump down to verse number 8. It says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of our unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And we see here that, that the false prophet, the Antichrist, the Antichrist is going to have um, lying signs and wonders. He's going to proclaim himself to be God. You know, he's he's going to sit in the temple of God, and he will have these miracles, and he's going to deceive a lot of people. The Bible says they're gonna be, his miracles are going to be so outstanding and so believable that says, if it were possible, they'd deceive the very elect. But it's not possible. If you're saved, you won't be deceived by this. But that's how, how good they're going to look. That's how much power he's going to show to persuade people that he is God. Because he wants everyone to worship him. That's Satan's ultimate plan. He wants everyone worshiping him. He doesn't want you worshiping God. He wants to be God. He wants to be just like the Most High. So God has people worshiping Him and following Him, and, and there's churches that, that worship and obey God. Satan wants that because he wants to be just like the Most High. And that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to bring about a one-world religion. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 13. And he's basically going to do this, and, and what he's going to do for the people who don't want to worship Him, he's going to kill them. And that's going to be at the time when the mark of the beast comes down because in order to receive the mark of the beast, you're going to have to, to worship the Antichrist. You're going to have to worship him in order to receive that mark. And hey, anyone who doesn't want to do that, you're going to be killed. That's going to be Satan's plan to bring about this one world religion. Revelation 13 verse number 3 says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. 
and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So he's saying, look, all the unsaved people are going to worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. And he's trying to bring around, he's talking about on the whole earth. He's talking about people, he's, he's bringing people together. He's bringing about this one world religion. Now, we need to be aware of that. We, we're not at this point just yet, but we're getting there. Satan is getting the churches ready to just, to just all come together under one Messiah. So there's, you know, you look at all the false religions of the world. There's, you know, the, the, the Muslims are looking for their, what, the fifth imam, right? They're looking for another prophet to come down. The Jews are looking for Jesus Christ, right? Judaism. They're looking for the first coming. They're looking for the Messiah because they don't believe Jesus is the Christ. You know, all these different religions, you know, and, and even Christianity, they're looking for the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is another reason why this doctrine is so important to understand that, no, the Antichrist is coming first. But so many Christians, they are deceived into thinking that, no, Jesus Christ is coming first. Right. Which is, which again, it's gonna, it, it just leads to confusion. You don't want any, any Christians getting deceived into thinking that, oh, is this Christ, you know, since Christ, if you think Christ is coming any moment, well, the Antichrist is coming on the scene first. You don't want to be deceived by that. We need to understand that, no, he is coming first. Be aware of that. Be aware of the devil's plan to get everybody to join hands and, and think that we're worshiping the same God when they're really not. You know the word, um, the word Catholic, it literally means universal. So the Catholic Church, it means there's a universal church. And we're against Catholicism. Now, even in the Presbyterian Church, I grew up as a Presbyterian. I grew up for, you know, the first however many years of my life that I had to go to that church. Um, we, we were required to, to learn the Apostles' Creed. And in the Apostles' Creed, it says, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. And to me, it didn't even make any sense because I didn't understand that Catholic meant universal. So I'm like, wait, we're not Catholic. We're Presbyterian. You know, like, what do you mean I believe in the, in the Holy Catholic Church? But I was just like, whatever. Um, I had to memorize it and repeat it, and that's what I did because I was a child. That's what, that's what we were supposed to do. So, um, but it's not just the Presbyterians. A lot of people you know, give credence to this Apostles' Creed, and they, they memorize it. They we had to chant it in church. You know? I mean, every once in a while, they'll just, we just all repeat the Apostles' Creed, and it's just something that's, that's brainwashing you, get in your head. Hey, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. No, I don't believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Yeah. I don't believe in this universal church that we're all just part of some universal church. The word church means a congregation. How can you have a universal church of this whole world if we're not all congregated in one place? It doesn't make any sense. We have to be congregated to have a church. It's false doctrine. Anyways, um, we need to be united in our faith among the brethren, as we saw earlier. Not among the world. We're not, we're not trying to just yoke up with the world. The Bible says, um, turn if you would to Jude chapter 1. Or There is only one chapter in Jude. Turn to Jude. <laughs> Sorry, my, my notes, when I, when I copy my verses, you see it's got the chapter and the verse, and I, and I copy them all over program, so it's like Jude chapter 1. Like, well, yeah, just turn to the book of Jude, um, <laughs> right before the book of Revelation. But unity of faith means coming together with the same faith, right? But it's not at all costs. It's not just sacrificing everything just so that we can, just for the sake of coming together. And it doesn't mean that we're going to compromise our doctrinal beliefs in order to simply come into agreement. I mean, if that were the case, then Jude wouldn't make sense here. Look at verse number three. He says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That word contend, that's fight. That, that you're fighting for the faith. You're not just at peace with everybody. Oh, let's just, just bring everybody together in unity. No, you're fighting for the faith. You're in opposition against people for the faith. Verse number four, why are we contending? Why is it? Because of verse number four. For there are certain men crept in unawares. This is the enemy. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. There are people out there, again, this is referring to false prophets. There are people out there with a false teaching. That's why we need to contend and fight for the faith. That's why these doctrines are important. That's why people look at you and say, oh, well, what do you, why, why do you care so much about this doctrine? Because there's people out there trying to deceive you. 
That's why we stand so firm on the doctrines that we believe and doctrines that we teach. That we're not just going to join hands with everyone because there's a lot of people out there that are liars. Amen. That are trying to deceive. That they've crept in unawares. They're, they're being deceitful. They're being sneaky and they're trying to lie to you and say God said this when he hasn't said this. Turn if you would to um, Philippians chapter number 2. We're almost done. Philippians chapter 2. We're going to focus now more on just getting unified within our church. Because unity is important. I don't want this to be misunderstood. I believe in this church being unified together in our faith. But not the universal unity of every single Christian denomination. That's not right. Because there's too many false teachers out there. But the unity within our church is going to be very, very important. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse number 1. It says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better themselves. Remember we read earlier about being humble and having that humility? Same exact thing. It's very important for our church to be united to have that spirit of meekness, to have a lowliness of mind. And it's not lowliness of you thinking, I'm not a good person, or, or that, you know, that, that you just have this poor perception of yourself. What this is teaching, lowliness of mind, esteem others better than yourselves. So it's not saying that, oh, well, I'm just some terrible person. No, you're saying, I'm going to value this person you know, more than myself and say, you know what, I'm going to do whatever I can to help you succeed. I'm not going to be so much focused about myself. I'm just going to be more concerned about, hey, what can I do to help you out? What can I do you know, to, to, to do whatever it is that's going to help make you successful and grow in the Lord? And I'm not going to be focused on what I need, me, 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 me. It's going to be focusing on other people within the church. That's what he's saying in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. So like for myself, it would be, oh, well, I'm the pastor, so I should have this and you should be serving me. No. That's, that's exactly opposite. I'm supposed to be a minister. I'm ministering unto you, unto the congregation. My job is to be here for you and to help you out and to help you grow. And even within the pew amongst yourselves and amongst other people in the church, you should be more interested in, hey, what can I do? I know that brother so-and-so is having a problem with this. How can I help them? And maybe that means you have to make your own personal sacrifice. You know, I have to take a day off of work to help them. Well, Love that person. Do what you can. Do whatever it is that you can do to help them out. Wh whatever the situation may be, have that lowliness of mind. When we have this type of an attitude with each other, we're going to come in unity as a family of brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse number four says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Flip back one chapter to chapter number one in Philippians. Chapter number one, verse number 27. We're going to see unity in our soul winning as well. Verse number 27 says uh, in Philippians 1, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. See, we can all come together and unite in that one spirit of the faith of the gospel. And, and that is something that brings... We, hey, we were all brought together yesterday. When we all came together, we are all united in our goal to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's something that's going to bring you together. Your love for God and your love for others is going to bring you together with everybody else within the church. And this is the mindset. This is the attitude. This is what we're focused on here in this church is on serving others, serving our community, and bringing that gospel of Jesus Christ. And the yeah. best way that we're going to be able to do that is, one, we got to make sure that word God wants to use us and you know we get ourselves cleaned up and, and we, we read the Bible, we believe His words, we're going, to, we're going to try to improve our own lives. But at the same time, while we're doing that, being focused on other people, helping them, bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to be used by God in a great way in this church. And as I said, I'm all for unity within our church. And again, this is why we use one Bible here. We're a King James only Bible church. Praise God. Because we don't want to have, first of all, we don't want to have, you know, 10 people all with 10 different versions of the Bible 
And you're looking down and we're preaching like, well, that's not what my book says. That's not, that's not what my book says. And I'll tell you what, all, the different versions of the Bible, they say different things. It's not just, oh, well, mine doesn't have the these and the thous. That's a lie. That's not true. People will try to tell you that, um, you know, oh, these newer versions, they're just designed to make it easier for you to understand. That's not true. They actually go and they've removed scripture. They perverted it. And if you want to know anything more about that, I can talk to me after the service. I'd be more than happy to explain that to you. But, um, hey, we want unity within our church. That's why we're going to use one Bible. Amen. 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 But um, turn, if you would, the last place we're going to turn is 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, so almost done. <clears throat> last point just on why we're not going to just bring everybody in. And see, a lot of, a lot of churches, they have a philosophy of bringing all the lost people into church so that they could bring, so that they could preach the gospel to them, or you know, preach them down the aisle, or whatever. We don't do that here, and the reason why is because church is, is primarily it's supposed to be a place for saved people to come together and learn and sing praises unto God. It's not for the world. That's why Jesus Christ said to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. We go out and reach them out in the world and try to bring them into God's house. To worship and serve God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, look at verse number 14. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? He's saying, how can you have unity with that? How could you come and, and um, get yoked together and have fellowship with the world. That's why we're not trying to bring the world in. That's why we don't have all the rock and roll music. That's why we don't have a, a, an environment that's here just to entertain you because that's what the world's looking for is entertainment. We're looking to serve and worship the God in truth and, and believe what His Word said. We don't have agreement with them. Verse 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. We're to separate ourselves from the world. Now, we go out into the world, and we're going to preach the gospel of the world, and try to get the world saved, try to get the, the law saved, but we're not to be fellowship and just, and just hanging out and being best friends with the world, and we're not trying to bring them into our church. Now, my goal, as I said, I, I want to be, I want to have a united church. I want to have a church family here, and I believe we do. We have this already, but this is the way that we're striving to keep it. Where, where we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, we all love God, we're all children of God, and, and we're going to do things for each other, and we're also going to be united in our main focus of bringing the gospel to the lost. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Dear God, I pray that you please help us to be aware of the false prophets that are out there that are preaching lies in your name. God, I pray that you please help us all to go home um, and, and read the Bible for ourselves. Help us to study. Help us to learn. Help us to know your word, dear God. It would be really unfortunate for, for especially when people are already saved, to get deceived, dear God, and to, and to follow some false prophet just because they don't know the Bible for themselves. I pray that you please help us to understand the importance of knowing your words because your word is truth, dear Lord, and um, there is no lies or deceitfulness within your words. I pray that you please help us all to learn them, to know them, and bring our church together in unity, God. I pray that you would please just build this church. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.